Good evening. Thank you for joining us as we continue our study of Isaiah. And I just hope that you've been enjoying it half as much as I have, learning some awesome, awesome truths, and also realizing that uh, the more I learn, the more I don't know how awesome it is. But today we're studying again in the book of Isaiah. But before we get started, as always, we want to open with prayer. Pray for the needs of uh, you and for me and our church and our extended families and our country. Got so many needs to pray for. So let's just join together and lift up these needs to you, our needs to him for you. Father God, we are so thankful for the opportunity to come to you. We are so thankful that your word tells us that you know what we have need of even before we ask. So none of these things catch you by surprise, but there's many needs represented by our listeners, many needs represented in our church family. Our nation is hurting today, and we ask you to touch and minister by your power. Have your way today. Help your word come alive to us. Help us to be truthful to your word and stay on task, Lord, and minister to these, your precious people. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In our last study, we spoke of the yoke being taken off by the anointing. And of course, ultimately, that anointing is the Holy Spirit. The anointing is the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pick up today in Isaiah chapter 10, begin uh, reading at verse 33. It says, See the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. The lofty trees will be felled, and the tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. Now I want us to go over to the book of Daniel, one of Daniel's prophecies, and read what Daniel had to say and see if that language seems a little bit similar. Daniel chapter 4, verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said, Thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beast and the grass of the earth. I felt like that terminology was very similar to what it was saying in Isaiah when it says that the Lord Almighty will lop off the boughs with great power, cut them down, and he will cut down the thicket. So he's comparing the nation of Israel with a forest, with a tree. And then it goes, uh, they lop off the branches. But if you go to the next chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Now, when we think of a shoot, we think of a sprout, and we may think of a bigger tree. But this word literally means a twig. A tiny sprout will come up from the tree that had once been the uh, family of David, once been the nation of Israel. And it uses the uh, term Jesse because it, it was drawing the analogy of the picture of coming from nothing. And of course, prior to David, the tribe of uh, Jesse and Benjamin was very insignificant. And so it says from out of this stump, out of this lineage of Jesse will come a twig, a shoot, a branch. And we understand that to mean the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that means that out of the stump of Jesse, out of that family and out of the nation of Israel that had been in bondage, that it was going to spring forth. And that twig represents life. What a twig. What a shoot. What a branch that that was going to be. It was going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read on. And it says that the Spirit of the Lord 
will rest on him, or the anointing, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with out of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be around 1,500 years uh, later before he was born. But it says, out of that stump of, of Jesse... Now, remember, they've just been prophesied. They're going to be taken into back, uh, captivity. They're going to be captured. They'll be there. Uh, but after a period of time, the yoke would be broken by the anointing, by the growth of, the, of, of spiritual things. And then it says, out of this stump will be the, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Isaiah begins to prophesy of latter times or latter days. It says the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will die down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. And the young child shall put his hand in the viper's nest. And they will neither harm nor destroy on all the holy mountains. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I think we would all agree that that's probably speaking about a future time. The time when the, the millennial reign, when Christ will reign and will have all peace. And everybody will peace one another. Even the animals will be at peace with one another. Another. Now, I want us to go over to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, see, he was someone else uh, that was around this time, and I uh, want to just read a passage there, where uh, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 17, as for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. It is not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet and the rest of your pasture and to drink of the clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet and must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Now, I know some of you say, well, what does this come into it? Remember, we're talking about the, the remnant. Remember, we're talking about the vile and the righteous. And even during the time of the, the vilest, there was a remnant of people. And we know that God is the only one with the authority, the only one with the capability of being a just God. And it says, thus, therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust all the weak with your uh, horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant shall be the prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. So we read out of Isaiah. We read out of Daniel. We read out of, uh, out of Ezekiel, telling us about that uh, lineage of, of David that's going to be the twig that comes up. They're going to be the Savior's lineage that's going to come from the stump of David. Now, our generation can look back to the birth of our Savior. We can see God's hand at work. We have history to guide us, the world history, as well as biblical history. The nation of Israel, 
how that nation of God's chosen people went astray, even though God did everything in his power. And I know some of you said, what do you mean in his power? He is all powerful. He will only can do things in accordance with his word and with his will. And, it, and he says, he is our good shepherd. Jesus Christ does everything he can to protect his sheep. When you look back at the history of the Jewish nation, do you think that God was working as a shepherd, doing everything he could to deliver them? Even when they wanted a king, he said, you don't want a king. You want me to be your God. But they insisted. And so the shepherd not only protects his sheep, but he invites them to come back into the fold. That's the picture that we're seeing in Isaiah here. The remnant, he said, I want you to come back in the fold. And we realize and, and know that for them, it'll be a number of years before they can get back to the nation of Israel. Now let's go back and, and read in Isaiah again. Begin reading at verse 10. It says, In that day, the root of of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. And that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from lower Egypt, from upper Egypt, from Cush and from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. I think we can understand, that, again, this is a dual reference. He was bringing people back from Babylon. He was bringing those a nation of Israel. He was promising to bring them back to his promised land. But he was also telling in future generations that I will be bringing the nation of Israel from literally all over the world, all over the world. And he was saying that that word banner, it'd be a banner or a flag, a standard. Now, one of the definitions of a, of a flag is a rallying point. And we understand that. We rally around the flag. The first time we hear the word banner in Scripture is in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. And notice this wonderful story as we read beginning verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Repton. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out to fight with Amalek. And tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him. And Joshua fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him and sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until they're going down the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial or so that you can always remember it, a rem memorial in the book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. Make sure Joshua gets this, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, or Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, saying, I hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. But he says, as long as that banner was raised, Israel prevailed. As long as that banner was raised, Israel prevailed. Now, we're going to read another scripture in Numbers. And that first reading, you may not catch the significance of it, but I believe you can realize that it too is a banner. And Numbers chapter 21, begin reading at verse 8. And the Lord says to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. 
Now that word pole is one of the words for banner. Set this fiery serpent on a pole. Now why were they doing that? Well, they had disobeyed God and the serpents had bitten them and people were dying by the hundreds. And in order to stop that, he said, make this serpent and make a flag or standard of it and lift it up. And it says, and everyone who is bitten when he sees that shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And I know some of you are probably saying, well, pastor, how does that uh, relate to us today? Because we haven't been bitten by a serpent. No, but we've all bitten by what we know is sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This was prophetic of that banner, that serpent being lifted up in the wilderness that later on Jesus would refer to that. You say, when? Well, over in Gospel of John chapter 3. Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Now, he was speaking to Nicodemus, a very intelligent, trained, articulate man. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No. One has ascended into heaven, except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the banner, as Moses lifted up the flag, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now that standard, that flag, that banner, of the cross is what rallies all of us. That is the rallying point of the Christian because without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. And because just as Moses left it, lifted up the serpent as a banner in the wilderness, that Jesus Christ would lift it up uh, on the Mount Calvary outside of Jerusalem so that every man could look to that cross and to be saved. That is our rallying points. And the amazing thing is Isaiah was writing hundreds of years in advance and he said that there will a shoot, a little twig will come out, out of uh, the stump of Jesse. And that twig will be from the branch and it will bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The very first thing in Jesus' ministry, when he went out and was baptized, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The anointing came upon him. Why? Because he was the twig that it spoke about. He was the one that Isaiah prophesied about, that he would be from the tribe of Jesse, from the tribe of David, and he would be also not just the Son of Man, but the Son of God, and everyone that looks to Him shall be redeemed. Everyone that reaches out to Him and rallies around that flag will be redeemed. What an awesome, awesome thought. Yes, when Isaiah wrote this passage, most of the people were in rebellion. But he said, in the midst of that, there's still hope. And that hope is in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, they were looking forward to the Messiah. We're looking back to Messiah. And can I encourage you today, regardless of what trials you're going through, regardless of what difficulty you're going to, would you look to the cross? Would you look to the Savior? Will you look to the resurrected Lord and know that He is our hope in the time of trouble? I want to pray with you tonight. Pray that you would realize, like I realize, that we need to look to Him, the author and the finisher of our faith. It originates with Him and it ends with Him. And we need to surrender to Him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your strength. And Father, just as surely as you said you would bring the nation of Israel from all of the world, 
you're causing people today to look to the cross. God, I believe there's some that are listening tonight that they may not understand all that we've shared, but they know that there's hope in Jesus. They know that He is the anointing, that the Spirit of God is the anointing, is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. It's the anointing that brings us all together. And Father, help us to be ever mindful of continuing as the body of Christ, just as Aaron and her lifted up the, uh, or Joshua and her lifted up the arms of uh, Moses, we too should lift up the cross so that people may come to him. God, we thank you for that, give you praise for it, and honor you in it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us. Lord bless you. You have a great week, and I'll talk to you next week.